Is that inner voice movement by any chance? Indeed. Nice. I'm Adam Manis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Daily jazz advice coming at you, coming at you from the Steinway today. That's right. If we sound a little more echoey than usual, it's because there's many more mics on us from a larger room because we're sitting in front of a 5 foot 11 inch Steinway. Oh. Right. Ooh. Oh. And Steinway. we've left the pod cave. You know, some people, some people thought that we live in the pod cave. Like lemmings <laughs> on the prairie. <laughs> we've... Like Golub, like Golub <laughs> coming from underground. I don't even know if he lives underground. I don't no. even know if that's his name, but you know, the troll dude coming out from the pod cave. Say Golub? Golub, isn't that his name? Gollum? Gollum. <laughs> Gollum. Not a fantasy guy. You know what? No, no, no. It's, if, if you're on the end like I am with that world, it's, <laughs> it's Golub. Golub. Yeah. My cousin's actually in the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> acting, right. acting in that. Right. PM yeah. Tolkien. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we've been threatening to do this for a couple weeks, and uh, we, get, oh, we always get such great responses when we do our episodes sitting at the piano, so yeah. we thought we would do this episode sitting at the piano, and today we are talking about inner voice movement and voice mm. leading. We're going to use the classic standard, all the things you are, Hello. because there's so much going on in this one. Um, I did this blog post, actually, I wrote a little uh, chord arrangement for uh, dealing exactly with this, uh, this very issue, voice leading and inner voice movement, on all the things you are. So you can go to uh, Open Studio Network slash blog if you want to see that. Yep. Maybe we'll even put a link in the uh, newsletter if you want to sign up for the old that newsletter. That would be nice. Yeah, and it's a great arrangement. I was looking at it again, I think you did this about a, a couple of months ago, uh, a month or so ago, and I... Um, you know, heard the way that you played it, and then it was so fun to look at the chart and to see how it kind of, you know, lays itself out visually. But you, you worked in a number of different, really interesting inner voice movement ideas in, well, you call it a chord arrangement, but it's really a, a, a beautiful musical arrangement, this too. Thanks. You know, I like doing this, and I, I actually suggest for pianists uh, to kind of work on your your voicing chops, so your, your improvising voicings all the time but when you kind of sit out and arrange even if you just did four bars or eight bars of a tune yeah and arrange out uh, um you know the voicings that you would use under a melody it can be eye-opening of what you leave behind when you're improvising and yeah. it kind of gives you something to practice towards so i do this every so often just to kind of like try to get new ideas that i can then work into my practice routine maybe get a good arrangement out of it that i can use on a gig yeah. Yeah, and I mean a little little pro tip for for you guys that are out there that are interested in in string arrangement, big band, any kind of ensemble beyond, um, you know, just a trio setting is that doing this kind of arrangement, and laying it out, gives you a great template for uh, what could be a larger ensemble um, arrangement. Actually, where you could take this because great voice leading, you know, at the piano is the same thing as vo great voice leading with vocals, with yeah. choir, with orchestra. It's just a matter of then thinking about the orchestration and how you apply it to the correct instruments in a way that makes sense to them. Yeah, actually this piano arrangement is, all the heavy lifting is done for say like an orchestral arrangement. Then it's just a matter of putting it, you know, putting it out to all the, to all the different instruments, the yeah. orchestration part. But yeah. this is sort of the meat of the, all of that. So before we kind of get going into anything deep on this, let's kind of define some terms um, we've talked a little bit about voice leading, I think, and really that's just, um, there, there are a whole bunch of obviously classical rules and things, but jazz kind of has its own pathway to this. Classical voice leading will always sound good, it'll always make sense. Well, good classical good voice leading. Good classical <laughs> voice leading, yeah. Some Much are, as good jazz voice leading. Some are French, you know what I'm saying? No. Um, but who? But, uh, but jazz, you know, when, when you start incorporating all the sevenths, the thirteenths, the ninths, uh, we have kind of our own rules with those. And so, um, we're just trying to get voice leading that doesn't sound clunky, that makes sense, that doesn't take the listener's ear off of what we want to put it on, which is in this case the melody. Right. So it's, it's complementary to. Yeah. It enhances. It doesn't get in the way of. It's it's okay, I think, to distract a little bit at the right times, the right amount. Um, but I think you know a, a great definition and kind of or guiding principle for voice leading in jazz is just the remember the melodic element. Of. Yeah. Like each one of your voices has, it doesn't have to be, and in fact it shouldn't be necessarily the most interesting and sophisticated melodic thing going on because then it will distract possibly from the, from the main melody. But it should be beautiful melodic. Sing it. See if you can sing it, especially if it's in your range, you know. Um, and if it falls well in the voice, it's probably some pretty good voice leading. Because we get caught up in the like, how they interact with the harmony, and that's all important. Mm -hmm. But 
first and foremost, voice leading needs to be really interesting and, and just well-crafted melodies. Agreed, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, some, some examples here that you can, you can use. I mean, some things that I like to do, the, f the first thing that you can do for good voice leading, everybody can just harmonize a melody. Let's say you have a melody that's just, you know, the easiest thing to do is to add something mm -hmm. parallel to that, you know, and that is voice leading, but it's not great voice leading. That's just kind of harmonizing more than right, anything. Right. The first kind of trick you, I think you learn is to do some kind of opposite mm. contrary motion. Whatever mm -hmm. that may be, whatever works with the melody that you're doing and, and maybe the chord changes you're doing. Um, when I think what you just showed there, do, do that again, the second one, and then the first way just in parallel. So you immediately get the independence of the voices, which I think is important to be able to, uh, to create interesting melodies so that the listener can hear that, and that in, in, is the kind of the easiest way to get it. Exactly right, yeah. So when we're talking about um, you know, good voice leading, you you know, ideally every single voice is its own little melody yeah. that, that makes sense, uh, you know, by itself. That's really, really good. You know, great choral writers are so good at that, yep. that, you know, every singer is singing a melody to them. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think part of the trick with that, and it really, can, you, you can apply this to the piano, to the guitar, to arranging, you know, big band, orchestra, anything that has multiple voices, part of the, 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 the key to that that works for vocalists and the reason great vocalists, I mean, um, vocal Arrangers do this if they if each section or part has an interesting melody and a beautiful melody They're gonna sing it all the better mm -hmm. and just like if you give the violas a great melody even if it's real simple But it's their own thing and it's good. It's not just sort of sitting on some footballs They're gonna play it better. I mean, I don't care if it's the Berlin Philharmonic the Vienna Philharmonic the, the St. Louis Symphony any of these great orchestras. It's just human nature You're gonna play something better the totally. better the quality. That's so true. So that's a trick that you know that, that vocal arrangers have been using forever, but it also works for the piano Yeah, and I think we're gonna see some of that is like you know, when we give the left hand, the top of the left hand, or the bass part or, or whatever something more interesting to play It's just easier to make it sound good Totally and to agree. stay engaged in it. You know, and another thing that, that the pianists can do, this is kind of a hack. This is kind of a growth hack. Yeah. Because you actually don't have to know a great voice leading for every single voice to kind of make it work on the piano. Sort of the first trick you, I mean, that I learned that not knowing what voice leading was, was not to use the same shape twice in mm. a row. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you don't do that, there's a good chance you're not moving things parallel to each other. Right. One of the voices is moving. So like if we just take these first two bars here of all the things you are. Right? So I have these two shapes. Yep. Now we know that all the things you are, everything is based off the third on this two. Right. It just follows the third around, you know, up, up fourths. So you could have, right. I could have done the same shape. Just moved it up a fourth. Right. But that does not sound nearly as interesting as, you know, moving this this bottom note here, which is the fifth, down to the root. Yep. And you're immediately getting that contrapuntal independent voice without even, you're actually only moving one of the voices, that kind of tenor voice, and only slightly, but because you're expanding out with your shapes, it already gives it, like, like what you did here, this is a great sound, but it's a very like chordal, vertical kind of sound. Totally. You know? And then you could expand it out, but but in but but in moving out immediately, you've already given it that independence before you even have to get into a lot of movement. You've been able to reserve that to a little bit later. That's so true, man. And like, it, it so it really is for pianists. And and if you're scoring out anything, if you're writing a string quartet arrangement, you know, if you just start by avoiding the same shape. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to go a long way. And it doesn't have to be very different either. Yeah. Like if you were to even do, you know, some different alternatives might be, you know. Um, like going with pretty much the same voicing, but moving the root down as one, well. One thing moves one differently. Thing. That actually right. will change the entire setup for your listener. Yep. You know? Good. So that's some kind of like basic voice leading and some, you know, the hack that you can do. There's, I mean, there's so many schools about it. Um, yeah, I think another good one here, and you've got it in a bunch of places, but you even get into it a little bit at the beginning, is just... Um, you know, so you got the shapes to, to de de delineate the different voices, but also any kind of different rhythmic feel mm. or movement between just one voice, not mm -hmm. necessarily two. You could do that later and you get into that, but as opposed to just or just. So now we. So you've already, you got this. And like if you had something else going like. You know. Oops. 
you know, any kind of moving that rhythm into there starts to draw the ear's attention just a little bit to those voices. Well, this brings us kind of to the next part of this of this episode and, and what the kind of goal of this arrangement was, and that is to have one voice, at least one voice, in every single bar have some kind of movement. And this presents all, whole other challenges to the voice leading, but like you, you just said, it also breaks up the harmony to the listener. And then for solo piano stuff, you know, now all of a sudden, I can provide a nice, lovely time feel just mm -hmm. by moving one note. Like you think you have to do all this. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't. You can yeah. just just by moving. Oh, please one... don't do all that. <laughs> <laughs> Not one... in that range. <laughs> by moving one note, I can make it feel pretty good. You know. Yeah, it gives that pulse. So you know, just by moving a voice up or down. This is the beginning of inner voice movement. You're taking yeah. one of the voices somewhere, not on the edges, although you can do the edges of, of the highest or lowest, and just moving it. You can rock it back and forth. You can move it down a diatonic step. You can move it up a diatonic step. Yeah, yeah. You know. Man, Shirley Horn it was so wonderful about doing this. You know, she would play voicings like this. And yeah. just like move a little bit. And then on that Here's to Life record, yeah, you know, the yeah. arrangements, a lot of those arrangements are actually fleshed out uh, voicings of hers, orchestrations. On the she, strings. They recorded that stuff and then Sweet. they added the strings wow. and arranged it around. So but you get a little bit of that, you know. And so it doesn't always have to be. it's going to get in the way. It can just be that little pulse thing and give it that groove. Too. Well, you do a whole thing with your left hand where you move one voice or you move two voices or you just kind of rock back and forth and it yeah. creates a whole feel for the, the right hand as a pianist. Yeah. Um, so, okay, now we have some, some basic voice leading. We have one movement where we just take one voice and we move it somewhere. There's kind of some exercises that you can work on as a pianist to kind of get these things going and that's really just to choose to choose a, a chord value and then say, I'm gonna move that every time. So yeah. if we're here on all the things you are, let's just say we're gonna move something around the fifth every time, right? So if I start here, and I'm not doing the chord arrangement, I'll just do my own thing here. If I start on the F, I do something with the C, and then to the B minor, I'll do something with around that uh, F, because that's the fifth of B flat minor. Mm -hmm. You know, and so on and so so forth. Yeah. You know, so there's some movement around it. There's you're starting either below it or above it, yep. going to it, or you're starting on it, rocking back and forth on it. And this is such an important way uh, that we recommend to practice uh, this kind of restricted practice, where you're going to say, because you're talking about to a specific voice. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. every chord that we play on this tune, I'm picking the fifth yep. and I'm, alter I'm moving that around somehow. Because what ends up happening, like you might get to the point where you could play some nice, you know, voice leading, inner voice movement over a tune like this, but you're basically doing things that are comfortable on certain chords that you know how to do, as opposed to getting, like, like how do we practice to get out of our comfort zone? Right. And this is the exact kind of thing that we preach here. Am, 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 I getting too, am I getting too preachy You're for you? You're just it? preachy <laughs> enough, man. No, but it's like you got to take yourself out of the comfort. This is not about like yeah. you would play the whole arrangement like this on the gig. Right. This is about practicing so that you're starting to discover and you're forcing your hands into new positions to hear things. You're not going to like the way all of these work, and that's okay, because they work. you're going to be using these at different times, but you've got to get them over every chord of this tune. And really, trying to go next level is taking this to different keys totally. so that you're really ha forced into different shapes. Same concepts, yeah. different concepts. Keys. And it doesn't have to be the fifth every time. And you know, you're not every tune you do is not gonna be all the things you are, where luckily the melody note is always the third. Right? Right, this right. is why you have to, to work it yep. on all the different notes, on all the different tones of the chords, the seventh, the sixth, the you know, the fifth, all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, hope this helps everybody. This is uh it's really fun. Man, I could geek out and talk about voice leading and voice movement all day. I know. Oh, that'd be great. But then we wouldn't be a daily podcast anymore, would we? No, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be an all-day podcast. We'd be an all-day podcast. <laughs> cool. There might be a market for all-day voice leading podcasts. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that would just like a live stream that never ended. <laughs> well, cool. Well, this is good. It's good to be back at the piano with you, Adam. And uh, we look forward to more of these um at the piano echoey affairs. Man. That's fun. right, yeah. If you want to ask us a question, a musical question, or a question, a, a topic for yeah. a future episode, go to youllhearit.com. You can also pick up one of our uh, t-shirts. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. I'm going to put a link to this uh, chart and this blog post on this arrangement yep. in the newsletter uh, the week this is going out. So make sure to subscribe. Yeah, subscribe there at uh, openstudionetwork.com slash podcast and learn some more about what we're doing. And until tomorrow, you'll hear it. <laughs>